It's Dr. Nyack from St. Louis, and today I'm going to talk about something that I get asked a lot of questions about, and that is, where will my facelift incisions be? What will they look like? Will people be able to see them? Is it going to look natural? And uh, I'm going to spend a little time here kind of showing you where they're going to be, telling you why I put them there, telling you why they heal really well, and then showing you some examples in women, in men, in uh, ethnic skin, give you some good examples of all those. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Here we go. So incision plan. The incision pattern that I choose, this is a diagram from the uh, video series that I've created to teach surgeons how to do facelift surgery. The incision pattern, it comes into various phases and various stages. So one, the facelift and neck lift incision typically is around the ear area. And why is that? Well, when we have excess skin and looseness in the jowl, this needs to be lifted and it has to go upward. You can't lift it any other direction. It has to go upward. And so the excess skin is going to get generated and pushed. It's kind of like making your bed. We're going to take this pleat and push it off the edge of the bed. So it has to go that direction. So people often ask, can we do this entirely from behind the ear? And the answer is no, because this skin, when it's sagging, it needs to go up. It can't go sideways or backwards. So that's the reason for the front part of the incision. The back part of the incision, back here, that's to capture the excess neck skin. And in some deep neck lifts, I'm able to do no ear incisions if elasticity is great. But over 40 or so in most patients, I need to take this excess skin and shift it back here and get rid of it at the hairline. So the incision itself is designed in such a way that it follows the curves and contours, the natural shapes of the ear and takes advantage of the highlights and shadows around the ear. It also takes advantage of the hair in certain areas. So let's take an example of this. Here's a one month old incision I'm gonna have you see. So this patient is one month after a brow lift, lower face neck lift, some skin care, um, rhinoplasty, and you can see her facelift incision. There it is, it's one month old and it's right where I drew it on those pictures. And you can see it's still a little fresh looking. There's the temple part of it. There's the in front of the ear. There's the behind the tragus. And then looping around the earlobe. From there it's gone behind the ear and then back down at the hairline. So I have posted this before and after picture many, many times. Um, with that incision visible, and not a soul has said anything about the incision line. So it's it's really striking. Even though it's right there in plain sight and it's one month old, it's hard to find. Her other one month old incision lines, one of them is behind the chin. It's right here. I'll show that to you and another person later. It's sideways. It lives where this crease used to live. I feel like it's much less visible than the crease. So that's kind of nice. And then she's had an open rhinoplasty. And so her, her rhinoplasty incision is this little fine pink line right here. So those are all her incisions at one month old. And that's pretty typical for a one month old incision. As we move on to a six week old incision, uh, this patient, she's got her ears exposed here so you can really see. The incision is starting to fade, but there's still some pinkness to it. And that is totally normal. We tell people to expect some pinkness to their incision line at the six week mark. It covers readily with makeup if you wanted to put it on. There's the chin incision. Again, it's less noticeable than the chin crease used to be, but it's, um, it's there at six weeks. And so that's something to know. So at six weeks, you can get your hair up if you want to. If you know exactly where to look and you have very critical eyes, you'll be able to see the incision. But if you have your hair down and or put some concealer or even just tinted sunscreen, or even just foundation over the pink, the pink fades away very rapidly. So that's a typical six week old incision line. Now we get to fully healed. So this is a fully healed incision line. And um, I love incision lines like this because they take advantage of a lot of these lights and shadows and contours. So if you look at the ear, it's got highlights wherever the ear has folded and has convexities. I think you should be able to see these white bright highlights all through those areas. Similarly, natural crisp highlights right here, crisp highlight right here. Well, that last one, that one, that's not a highlight, that's the scar. So scars typically heal fairer or more light than the surrounding skin. So when you look at this, 
here's her incidental scar. It's sitting right in the junction between her ear and her cheek. And so that's a good place to put it because cheek skin and ear skin have different textures. And when we put the incision line at the border of these textures, it's hard to find. From there, it's gone up and now it's riding right on the free edge of the tragus. And if you look at that up close, it looks like, and you can see it right there, it just looks like the reflection that is naturally present on the tragus. You see it, but you don't really notice it. And again, this is under high magnification, super sharp digital lens, hard to see, even when you know where to look. From there, it's traveled up into the little area in front of the ear. I'll show you this better on the next patient. And then up into the temple hair. And if we look closely, you will see actual hairs growing through the incision line. This is called a trichophytic incision. And that helps camouflage the incision line because it's got hairs growing through it. So that's a very typical, very classic, oh, I'd say six month old incision line. This is a young woman, good friend of mine now. She has been seeing me for years. She comes up from the South, um, I think Tennessee or Arkansas. Forgive me, I can't remember if it's Tennessee or Arkansas. She's going to make fun of me after this video. Um, and she drove up getting filler for years. And then one day she says, don't be mad at me, but um, I want you to do my facelift. And I said, why would I be mad at you? Well, she says, well, I already had a facelift with my local guy. It was just so much more convenient. I didn't want to drive to St. Louis. Um, and the picture here on the left, she had already had her facelift. And this thing, which she called her evil goozle, was still present. And her little modest jowl was still present. The only thing she really got out of that facelift is an incision line that, in my opinion, is kind of a lazy incision line. It's just a straight line. doesn't take advantage of all of any of these beautiful places that could be used for camouflage. I mean, this is where it really needs to go, is in those beautiful camouflage zones. But instead, there's that straight line, and you can just see it, the whiteness right there on her cheek. And I think it kind of calls out a facelift, despite the fact that the benefits of a face neck lift haven't really been achieved. So this picture on the right is after um, I revised her face neck lift. Um, I think you'll see that her jawline looks really pretty. There's a really nice, pretty clean jawline shadow. The evil goozle is gone, and she's got a pretty, pretty neckline now. But even more importantly, if you compare her old ear incision right here to her new ear incision right here, it is much better camouflaged. I think she's got, really has her cake and eats it too. She gets a beautiful neck with no visible incision line. So that's a very good example of why the incision placement and design really matters. Another view of this, I mean, just absolutely beautiful. She's got a really nice jawline really nice goozolectomy. There's no goozle left. And whereas before, her incision line was obvious right there in front of her ear. Now I challenge you to find it. It's really, really well hidden. So that's an important, important thing about incision line placement and design. Even on the front view, she just looks gorgeous. Um, I saw this picture on her social media a few, few months after that. Um, people say, you know, you made her look like her own daughter. And in this case, yeah, I really do think I made her look like her own daughter. So that's kind of cool. Let's talk about submental incision lines. Sub means beneath and mentum means chin. So the incision line under the chin, the submental incision line, we design it to be right in this crease. I have done all kinds of different things. There are strong proponents of putting it beyond the crease, and they say that it heals the best. In my personal experience, I've, I've liked it right in the crease. I've tried everything. Um, again, this is our one month post-op woman. Remember her ears? So this is a one-month post-op chin crease incision, and you just get a hint of it. But it's all it's better than the actual chin crease, so I'm perfectly happy with that. Here's a different patient. She's six weeks in. Um, again, I think we showed you her a minute ago. You can see her six-week-old incision line, still a little bit pink, totally normal. Has not fully had the hair grow through the incision line yet. It absolutely will. But... Down here in the submental region, she's also pink at her chin crease incision. And that is also to be, to be expected. That's just normal. That fades away a few more months, that will be gone. Um, but on, anyway, that little bit of pinkness for a few months, I think, is, is a, a, a good trade-off for what you get. So this person is more like six months, four to six months after her surgery. 
and uh, you can really see now the submental skin crease incision is practically invisible at this point. There's almost nothing left to see and certainly is less visible than the fold that was there to begin with. So I'm happy with that too. Now what problems do I run into? And if you are, if you are eagle-eyed, you may have seen some of these in the previous slides. I do still see some hypopigmentation. Hypo means beneath or low or inadequate pigmentation. And so hypopigmentation means the incision line heals fairer than the surrounding colors. And we often take advantage of that. I mentioned it a little while ago, putting the tragal incision right there so it re resembles the highlights around the natural curves of the ear. So when it turns white, it looks like a reflection. That's kind of good. But then there's some other areas where you'll catch, catch little hints of white. There's an area catching little hints of white. Or up here in the temple hair, this one really hypopigmented. It's actually on the same woman I showed you on the other side. Um, we don't have full control over the color that the skin sometimes heals. So if this really, this is a minimal one. Um, if this is really severe, there's some tricks we can do to improve that. But uh, this really only matters under close inspection, close magnification. It wouldn't bother you in real life, but it's possible. On ethnic skin, um, we have a couple considerations. One is the incision lines themselves, often on ethnic skin. This is a patient of Indian heritage. Um, the incision line itself doesn't often heal quite as high quality, quite as thinly as it would in a thinner, paler skin type. And then two, there's sometimes a tendency for it to be a little silver. So that happens to me on all my incisions. I get kind of silver healing, and that's the nature of the biology. But interestingly, this part's pretty good. This part you can't even see. And then this, this part turned a little bit silver. So we don't have full control over that. So things to know about. What about men? So I generally do the same incision line pattern on men. Um, but there are some unique things to think about. So when I lift a man, normally the beard hair stops in front of the ear. When I lift a man and this skin gets lifted, it lands up here. And so in men, it is common to have beard hair appear on the tragus. And most men of a certain age are used to having hair grow out the back of this thing anyway, so they just shave the front. But if it really bothers them or they really want to avoid that, what I'll do is instead of coming behind this little tab, like that, instead I'll actually come in front. So we leave the original skin that was on the tragus in place, and then they don't have to shave the tragus. It's a personal decision. I let the man decide whatever they want. They both look great. But um, that is one unique consideration with men, is this bearded skin can land up here. Similarly, this bearded skin can land up here behind the ear. And so that we don't have many ways around. Um, we can laser hair remove either of these areas. We can trim the hair follicles from the backside. We can use electrolysis. So there are ways to treat it in the end. But it's something a man needs to know about. They may find themselves shaving in areas they didn't shave previously. Behind a man in the man's ear, this is not my finger, it's uh, uh, the patient's finger. Um, right up here, you can kind of see the incision line just a little fair. There it is. And then right down at the hairline. So even under close inspection, you know, if you really know where to look and really pull the ear forward, you can find it. But just day-to-day -day life, when you see a guy walking around, you'd never know. Poor incision line placement. This one's not mine. Um, this is a patient I was revising, and uh, it's a good example of why incision lines have to be designed correctly and why you can't put tension on the skin. You can't pull the skin trying to get the lift. All the lifting has to be done on the deep layer. This person was closed with the skin pulled, and then over time, as it healed, the incision line drifted far away from where we intend to have it in the nooks and crannies around the ear. Even this one drifted forward. Um, it also hypopigmented, and it also became broad. The hypopigmentation, I said I don't have a lot of control over, but the drifting and widening, that is from tension. So in summary, that's where the incision lines go. Um, if they're done well, they're really hard to find, and uh, it's normal to see them initially. They fade out, and then they're gray. I would hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.